We're so glad that you've chosen to join us for worship today. We're excited as we begin a brand new series from the book of First and Second Peter, uh, not only in, in Frank's preaching, but in our, our times of worship as well. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right into the worship service. God, we offer this time to you, and we praise you and honor you in this place, for you are our Lord and our Savior and our Creator and Redeemer. And so we offer it. As, a, as an offering and a sacrifice to you, Lord, we pray that it would be pleasing to you and that your name would be glorified through our time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Every knee will bow 
before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion and the series called Ancient Promises in a New Normal. If you have not yet received your journal of First and Second Peter, that's what we'll be studying in this series. There's also a bonus letter here by Jude, who was one of Jesus' brothers. And so we'll be studying First and Second Peter. If you didn't get a journal yet, contact us. We'd be happy to get it to you. Even if you're watching this online from somewhere far, far away, we thank you for joining us. And we'd love to provide you with one of these journals as we go through this study together as well. Right now, I wanna ask you to do this. Pause the video and answer this question. What comes to your mind when you hear the name Peter? Peter, he was the leader among the apostles. He was always mentioned first in all of the lists of the apostles. We have more information given to us about the apostle Peter than anyone else in the gospels except for Jesus Christ himself. 
We learned that Peter was a fisherman and he was there when Jesus called him to leave his nets and his boats behind and to come and be a fisher of men. Peter's the one that got out of the boat and had faith enough to walk on the water even if it was only for a moment. He actually drew a sword at the arrest of Jesus and cut a man's ear off. And then, as Jesus had predicted, Peter denied Jesus three times, denied that he even knew him. And then after the resurrection of Jesus, Peter was forgiven and, and confirmed and restored to this place of apostleship. Something else that we learned from history about Peter is that according to tradition, Peter was forced to watch as the Romans crucified his wife. And he encouraged her with the words, remember the Lord. And then when it was time for Peter to be crucified, he pled with the Romans not to crucify him in the same way as his Lord, that he, that he was not worthy to be crucified the same way that Jesus was, but rather he should be crucified upside down. And we're told that in A.D., around 67 or 68, that that tradition came true and that Peter was crucified upside down. And so in Peter's first letter, written around A.D. 64 or 65, the time that Nero was the emperor of Rome, written from the place that Peter describes as Babylon, which was a code name for Rome, a wicked place, written to the persecuted Christians. We know some of this from history. The great fire of Rome was an urban fire that occurred in July of 64 AD. It began in the merchant shops around the Roman chariot stadium on the night of July the 19th. And after six nights and days, the fire was brought under control. But before the damage could even be measured, it reignited and it burned for another three days. The fire began in the slums the area's homes burned very quickly and the fire spread north. It was fueled by high winds. And during the chaos of the fire, there were reports of heavy looting and lots of violence. Hundreds of people died in the fire. Many thousands were left homeless. In the aftermath of the fire, two-thirds of Rome had been destroyed. Now rumors began to spread that Nero himself had ordered the fire to be started to make room for a new palace. Their bitter resentment was so severe that Nero realized that he had to redirect their hostility. And many historians and Christian tradition, tradition teaches us that the Emperor Nero blamed the devastation of this fire on the Christian community within that city. And that initiated the empire's first persecution of the Christians. This is so important for us today. This first generation of Christians in the Roman Empire were lied about. They were falsely accused. Their history of peace and generosity was largely ignored. They were pitted against each other and they were persecuted. And that sounds kind of familiar to what's happening in many of our major cities today. But even with all of that set aside, there is a battle going on and it is a battle that we are all a part of and we always have been. It's a battle to make a right choice. It's a battle to overcome a temptation. It's a battle to heal from the scars of a past hurt. And while the world around us is in chaos and on fire, let that all serve as a reminder that our enemy is not each other. Our enemy is the father of lies and the creator of confusion. And so through this letter, Peter teaches how to live victoriously in the midst of hostility, without losing hope, without becoming bitter, while trusting in the Lord. Peter even impresses on all of us that living an obedient, victorious life, even during extreme duress, a Christian can actually begin to evangelize the hostile world around him. And so we begin studying this letter to the first generation of Christians during a time of great struggle in this world and to us. Peter begins his letter, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and 
Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now this word that we see translated in the ESV as exile, I think is originally translated more accurately as sojourner. And so this word sojourner or exile in the Bible, it refers to a person who is just passing through. And that's an important point. I'd like for you to write that in your journal. The term sojourner or exile in the Bible refers to a person who is just passing through. Other translations will call it sojourner, exile, pilgrim, foreigner, alien, or stranger. It's like the, the Hebrews in the Old Testament and the time that they spent in Egypt and even the 400 years that they were enslaved there, they were not from that land. That land was not their home. That land was not their final destination. They were just passing through. And Peter writes that the persecuted Christians were not even scattered from their homes. They were just leaving a temporary place, a place through which they were just passing through. And when he says that they were just passing through, he's not just talking about Rome. He's talking about this world. They and we are not at home in this world. We are all just passing through on our way to our final destination, our eternal destination. And even while this world may seem so familiar to us, it's all we've ever really seen. It's all we've ever really experienced. We must not live here as citizens of this world. We must live here as strangers, for we are citizens of heaven and we are just passing through. Would you pause the video again and answer this question? How do we keep our identities as followers of Jesus Christ? How do we keep our identities as strangers in this familiar place?
There's one thing I know Great, great is your faithfulness Oh, great, great is your faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness Morning by morning New mercies I see All I have needed Thy hand hath provided Great is thy faithfulness Lord, unto me. After Jesus performed his greatest miracle yet, raising Lazarus from the dead, John records these words in John 11:53. So from that day on, they planned together to kill him, to kill Jesus. Jesus, therefore, no longer continued to walk publicly among the Jews, but went away from there to the country near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. Therefore they were seeking for Jesus, and were saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. And so... The stage is now set for the greatest drama in human history. Man would do his worst in killing the perfect Son of God, and God would give his best, his Son, as the perfect Lamb. After I pray, please pause the video and have your own communion time with the one who died for you, and then resume the video. Father, we thank you so much for sending Jesus to die for us. Please bless these elements that we are about to receive as we share together with each other and with you. And forgive us of our sins through Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Though I'm pressed on every side, I still know I'm not abandoned Though the ways of God aren't mine I still know I'm not forsaken Take all the breath in my lungs You'll hear the rocks crying glory to God Take every the cross forever speaks Though I'm filled with questions why I still know I'm not abandoned Though I suffer in this life I still know I'm not forsaken Silence me, but the cross forever.
forgiveness for my enemy mercy and grace I am set free the price of love is paid The big idea of this passage, the very introduction of Peter's first letter, the big idea of this sermon today is this, write this in your journal. The world will attack us with everything that it can. Stand firm. The world has no claim on you. The world is going to attack us in every way with every weapon that it can muster, but we can stand firm we are strangers in this place. We are sojourners that are just passing through. The world has no claim on you if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. The world hated Jesus and it will hate you for loving Jesus. And it may even mask its hatred with some warped sense of social justice. But just know that the world has no claim on you. And so how can we hold on to our identities as followers of Jesus Christ in this place which seems so familiar to us because it's the only place that we've ever really known? Well, number one in your journal, you can write this down. We are strangers in this land. We are strangers in this land, not because the land has changed, but because we have changed. Now, I'm not saying that the land hasn't changed. It certainly has. The land has changed. The early Christians went from being tolerated to persecuted by Rome. Maybe we have gone from being one nation under God to something completely different than that. Maybe you have gone from being treated with respect and understanding about your faith in Jesus Christ to being ridiculed. Maybe the land has changed, but that's not the point. The changes in this world are not what make us strangers. We are strangers because we have changed. We are strangers because we have gone from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God. We have gone from darkness to light, from death to life. We have gone from bondage and sin to freedom in Christ. We are citizens of a different world. We are citizens of heaven. Now, one could become a citizen of Rome in a few different ways. You could be born to parents who are both Roman citizens. You could be born to a Roman father if the mother was granted a contract of Roman marriage. You could be born in certain provinces within the Roman Empire to wealthy families that they wanted to grant this citizenship to. You could be awarded citizenship because you were a loyal subject and someone that the, the empire had great interest in. Or you could purchase your citizenship at what is called in an example that comes from Acts 22, 28, a large sum. We don't know exactly what that is, but you could actually purchase your citizenship. Friends, our citizenship comes also with a great cost. Ephesians 1, verses 7 and 8 says, In Him, in Jesus, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. In the very beginning of his letter in 1 Peter, Peter refers to the sprinkling of his blood. 
And it is only through the blood of Jesus Christ that our sins are washed away and his righteousness is placed on us. That is when we become citizens and joint heirs with him. And all of this is beautifully symbolized through baptism. Write this in your journal. We have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus and we belong to him. Jesus has purchased us and we belong to him. Sins against a holy and infinite God require a holy and infinite sacrifice. And the blood of Jesus shed on the cross paid for our sins and our rebellion against God. We are ransomed and freed by the price that Jesus paid, which was his very own life. And this purchase actually frees us. It doesn't put us into bondage to be purchased by Jesus. It actually frees us. It forgives us. It blesses us with grace and wisdom. And that means that we willfully submit. We willingly seek his will and not our own. And his will is that we don't get too comfortable in this world. That we're strangers here. That we're just passing through. We don't belong to this world. We once did, but we have changed. Number two, write this in your journal. We are strangers in this land. We do not adopt its customs or embrace its worldview. As believers of Jesus Christ, as his followers, we are constantly exposed to a world system that is energized by Satan himself. And his effort is to discredit the church and to destroy the church's credibility and integrity. And one way that he does that is by finding Christians whose lives are inconsistent with the Bible and then parading them before unbelievers to show what a sham the church is. As Christians, we must stand against the enemy and we must silence the critics by the power of holy living that comes only from having the Holy Spirit make a change in us from the inside out. In his letter, Peter writes about two categories of truth. And the first category is positive. And it includes a long list of blessings that are bestowed upon us. Peter mentions our privilege and our blessing one after another. But then interwoven into this list of privileges is this catalog of suffering. We, though we are greatly privileged, should also know that the world will treat us unjustly. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are strangers in a hostile, Satan-energized world. And our lives can be summed up as a call to victory and glory through the path of suffering. Listen to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Do you hear that? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Both body and mind discerning and conforming to the will of God as he reveals his will through his holy word. So in this world of trouble, we will respond with love, not hate. We will embrace truth, not lies. We are drawn to character, not to popularity. We don't check to see which way the wind is blowing. We check to see which way the word is directing. We love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we love our neighbors as ourselves. And while the world chants, love, not hate, while cities are burning and innocent people suffer violence, let's respond with more than token words. Let's respond with actions, but actions that keep one eye on eternity. Write this in your journal. We pour our hearts and our minds into things that will last for eternity. Do you hear that? We can't be consumed by the circumstances of this world. We pour our hearts and our minds into the things that will last for eternity, things that will outlive us. And while I pray that we are invested in the political process, we are not consumed by it. And while I pray that we are engaged in social justice, we aren't tricked by evil people that are looking for opportunities to make excuses to do evil things. 
We care about this world and we care about the people in it, but we are not shaped by this world. And number three in your journal, we are strangers in this land. We exemplify the values and standards of our home in heaven. Our first and primary citizenship is in heaven. And friends, I'm a patriot. I love this country. I feel blessed to be here. I have served our country. I have family members that have served our country. And I am grateful for our founding fathers and the principles on which our nation was founded. But our first and primary citizenship is in heaven. Our first and primary constitution is the Bible. Our first and primary commander in chief is Jesus Christ, the head of this body. We are to live with radically different priorities than the world around us. Philippians 3.20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. We are sojourners, and as such, we are ambassadors for our Father, the King. And we plead with men and women. We plead with them to be reconciled to him. Now, this world is not our home. And the knowledge of that truth tells us that we are strangers in this place. And that truth, that we are strangers in this place, keeps us from setting our hearts on this world's treasures. But rather, we store up treasures in heaven. We hold everything that God blesses us with, with open hands, knowing that everything that we have is all temporary. We don't pour our hearts and our passions into things that won't last. You know, it's tragic when a sojourner falls in love with this world. He begins to compromise his faith and his priorities, his values and his standards. Listen to this quote from a preacher. Modern Christians hope to save the world by being like it, but it will never work. The church's power over the world springs out of her unlikeness to it, never from her integration into it. And friends, that was written by a preacher 100 years ago, and it's never been more true than it is today. We want to save the world. We'll never do it by looking like the world. We'll never do it by sharing in the world's values and standards. Instead, we choose to shine as a light in contrast to the darkness, not trying to meet the world in the shadows of compromise. We are strangers here, sojourners. We're just passing through. And as much as, me, as much as we may love and appreciate this place in which we live, we do not mourn those who leave here as followers of Jesus Christ. They are simply going on to where they belong. Write this in your journal. We live every day with our bags packed, ready and eager for God to call us home. And those bags that we pack waiting for God to call us home, they are not filled with things from this world. Rather, they carry our joy and our hope and our faithfulness. And while we struggle to comprehend some of these things, because again, this world is what we have experienced. This world is what we see with our very eyes. We understand that there is a battle raging for our attention. Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You will hate one and love the other. And a choice must be made. Will we exemplify the values and the standards of this world or the place in which our citizenship is held in heaven? A choice must be made, and to make no choice is to choose. I'm going to ask you to pause the video again and answer this question. What from this world seems to have the greatest tug on your heart? And what I mean by this question is, what is pulling you away from God? What is pulling you in the opposite direction of the values and the standards of heaven? Is there something that maybe your group can, can pray about today as you minister to each other? What is it from this world that seems to have the greatest tug on your heart? One day the 
there'll be no more children longing for a home. One day when the kingdom comes right here where we stand, we will see the promised land. Mm -hmm. One day there'll be no more lives taken too soon. One day there'll be no more need for a hospital room. One day every tear that falls will be wiped by his hand, and we will see the promised land. Oh, hallelujah, there will be healing from this heartbreak we've been free. Sing in the darkest night Cause we know that the light will come And there will be healing Hallelujah One day there'll be no more anger left in our eyes One day the color of our skin won't cause a divide one day we'll be family standing hand in hand And we will see the promised land We will see the promised land Hallelujah There will be healing From this heartbreak We've been feeling We're singing the darkest night Cause we know that the light will come And there will be healing Hallelujah. There will be healing. Hallelujah. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. One day when a tired and weary bones find their rest. One day when the power of evil's brought to an end, we will see the promised land. We will see the promised land. Hallelujah. There will be healing from this heartbreak. We've been feeling. We'll sing in the darkest night because we know that the light will come and there will be healing. Hallelujah, and there will be healing. Hallelujah, and there will be healing. Hallelujah. Peter wrote this letter to the first generation of Christ followers. They were hated in the Roman Empire because of their sense of morality. They were seen as a threat to the pagan worship of that day. And then excuses were made and lies were told in order to attack and persecute them. And they would either bend their knee to the popular opinions of the day, or they would be driven out of the very communities in which they lived. And so to us. Do you value God's idea of family, of freedom, of life, even life still in the mother's womb? If you do value those things, you will be hated for it by this world. Do you reserve your worship for the one true God, the way, the truth, and the life? No other way to the Father except through Jesus Christ. If you do, you will be seen as a threat to the ideas of this world. Are you attacked as intolerant or hateful or narrow-minded? That is nothing new. Jesus was attacked for all of those very reasons, and the first generation of Christians were as well. Will you bow before popular opinions and worldviews of the day? You may even be driven out of your community, out of your school, out of your workplace, if not physically, certainly emotionally distanced and shunned. Maybe this hostility in which we find ourselves today, maybe this tension is what we can call a new normal. I want to encourage you 
the way that Peter encouraged the, the, the recipients of his letter, stand firm. This really isn't your home anyway. We're just passing through. And so I say to you what Peter wrote to them, words that were breathed out by God and then written by Peter to this group of Christians in his letter. And I think it's exactly what we need to hear right now. And I wanna encourage you to let this part of our, our text today to be your memory verse for the week. First Peter one and the last part of verse two, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Do you find hope in those words? Words breathed out by God. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. You are a stranger in this world. And what this world values, what this world embraces, what this world rewards is very different than that of the Christ follower. Grace and peace will be needed in great supply. And that's okay because God has plenty. The very grace through which we were saved will carry us through the troubles of this world. And the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding does not promise to take away the trouble, but rather promises that God will be with us through the trouble. Those are promises that you can hold on to during the most difficult of times. So how will you respond? We see in our text from today in just these couple of short verses Peter pulling a, a response out of his recipients right here at the very beginning of his letter. He communicates these things, and I want to encourage you with this response today in your next step. You are chosen by God. Choose him. God has chosen you. He has sent Jesus Christ to, to be a sacrifice for your sins so that you can be a part of his family and have your citizenship in, in heaven. So choose him. You are cleansed by Jesus' blood. Thank him. Live a life of gratitude. Live a life every day that thinks about the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross so that you can live forever with him, so that you don't have to feel and carry the, the weight and the guilt and the shame of your sin. But Jesus nailed it to the cross and it is gone and his righteousness has been placed on you. Thank him. Live a life of gratitude and you are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So trust him. You are being changed from the inside out. The Holy Spirit is working on you and he's not done with you yet. And he certainly isn't done with me yet. As I've said over and over again, we are on this journey together. Let's continue to invite the Holy Spirit to do his good work in us. And I'll close with this quote written by C.S. Lewis. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Thanks for worshiping with us again today. We're so grateful that you've come to be a part of this and definitely would encourage you to be praying for uh, those who are meeting up at the church this morning while you're watching this video perhaps. We'll uh, stop during our worship service and pray for those of you who are viewing the, the service uh, online this morning. We pray that you've been encouraged and challenged maybe to uh, greater levels of spiritual growth today. As always, if you would like, leave a, a comment uh, in the comment section. Ask for any feedback. Contact us at uh, the church's phone or email and uh, let us know if you have any questions or anything that we can do to help with the need. And finally, uh, if you would like to give to uh, New Horizons Christian Church to help us in the ministry and the outreach to our community, uh, of course, there'll be a slide right after this short video to show you the different ways that you can give online uh, by uh, text to give and uh, through the mail. You can do it any of those different ways. So uh, certainly uh, appreciate any uh, support and encouragement financially that you offer. And uh, we pray for you this week. Let me close with prayer today. God, I thank you this day for your many blessings. And I thank you for the, those who are worshiping today outside of our church. I pray as well for those that are worshiping at the, the facility, Lord. And I look forward to the day first when we're all able to worship together at our facility. But more than that, Lord, we look forward to the day when we will all worship together in your presence in heaven. 
Until then, Lord, we continue to serve and minister and, and do the things that you have called us to do, uh, to encourage, to build up, to strengthen, to uh, offer your love and compassion to those that we run into, those that are in our world. And, and, uh, and Lord, give us the strength to do that. And we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.